Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Aviation Outlook webinar program this evening. I'm Alan Stolzer, Dean of the College of Aviation at the Daytona Be Beach campus. And on behalf of my fellow aviation deans, Drs. Holt and Witcher, we have the pleasure of welcoming you this evening. Looks like our audience is filing in and it looks like another sizable audience. Uh, so we're very uh, gratified to see that. I'm really excited about our program this evening. It's going to uh, involve a very special guest, Joseph Marshall, and a different uh, realm of aviation than we've done previously, and one that I think will be, be very beneficial for our uh, aviation audience to hear. So uh, I'll introduce Joseph. He's been flying since 2005 and working professionally in aviation since 2010. He holds a commercial pilot certificate and is a certified flight instructor as well. His manned aircraft experience ranges from flight instruction, charter operations, and safety program development, implementation, and management. Joseph is also a certified flight attendant, remote pilot, and SMS manager. Moving into unmanned operations in 2015 with Amazon Prime Air, Joseph developed and implemented the Prime Air Safety SMS program and was also part of the Part 135 development efforts. Today, Joseph is Director of UAS Flight Operations for Zipline, where he is assisting with the launch of their North Carolina operation. In short, Joseph is an enthusiastic and passionate national, nationally recognized leader in unmanned aviation. And having visited with him several times, I know our audience is really going to benefit from hearing his perspective tonight. So Joe, thank you very, Joseph, thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm going to hand this over to my colleague, Dr. Bob Thomas, who is Assistant Professor of Aeronautical Science. Uh, Bob and uh, Joseph will have a, a conversation and will also pose some questions from the audience. So again, welcome Joseph and Bob, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Stoltzer uh, for the introduction and welcome Joseph. I know you're uh, on location in uh, balmy and a little bit stormy North Carolina tonight. To say the least. Yeah. <laughs> So one of the things um, I'd like to remind our audience as well, at the bottom of your screen is a Q&A button. If you have a question you'd like to ask our guest, go ahead and uh, hit the Q&A button and ask your question. We'll review them and work them into our conversation as best we can. When uh, a lot of the people register, they also ask some of the questions which I've worked into our, our plan for this evening. So feel free to ask some questions and we'll try to fit in as many as we can tonight. So first thing I'd like to start with is a little bit about your background. I think everybody as they go through aviation has some key points in their life that kind of push them to the aviation career. So I wanted to find out a little bit about what interested you in aviation and also how did you end up attending Embry-Riddle? Yeah, great question. And, and before we get started, just wanna say thank you for having me. Uh, super excited and apologies ahead of time if I'm, if I'm using my, my handkerchief to blot the sweat. <laughs> it, is, it is very hot, but bear with me there. But again, thank you for having me. Um, you know, I, I always wanted to fly commercially, loved, loved air, airplanes since I was a small child, like, like most who end up attending Embry-Riddle. Um, you know, I attended my, uh, obtained my PP or my, my PPLs, excuse me, in, in high school. Um, and I actually knew I wanted to attend Embry-Riddle early on in my high school career. And to be quite honest, you know, the economics drew me to having a hybrid approach to my education. Um, you know, I got my Associates of Science and flight certificates outside of Embry-Riddle and ended up transferring in uh, to complete my, my bachelor's of science at, at Embry-Riddle. So it was a bit of a unique experience, but you know, it enabled me to get the exposure and education I needed to, to succeed in the aviation industry. And you know, Embry-Riddle always encouraged me to put myself out there you know, and, and essentially was a deciding factor um, in obtaining my first internship uh, with Allegiant Airlines. You know, it was uh, Embry-Riddle that kind of was that deciding factor to get me through the door. Um, and that really set the tone for my career trajectory from airlines, ground handling, and now uh, UAS. Um, you know, so, you know, Embry-Riddle, I, I say, is essentially the Harvard and Yale of, of aviation. And the Eagle reputation, I can say, goes a very, very long way. 
Um, and I'm very proud to say that I'm an Eagle. So um, yeah, it, it just really stemmed from my, my passion since I was a small child. Um, and then leading into the focus and exposure that I had, you know, starting in high school and, uh, you know, leading up from there. Well, I know you said there's definitely with your variety of certificates, even your flight attendant certificate, it's a, quite a, a vast background of aviation history you have there. So one of the things that I was curious was, how did you decide to switch, so to speak, from man to unmanned? Because it looks like when you started your career, you're kind of leaning towards the man side, and then now you switch to the unmanned side. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and honestly, um, you know, it, it kind of happened organically. Um, it wasn't necessarily a decision that, that just happened naturally. And I said, I'm going to go from, from man to unmanned. You know, I was, uh, you know, back in 2015, 2014, 2015, I was very content, really enjoyed uh, my work. I was at a 121 air carrier with the Legion Airlines, you know, building and, and managing their, their safety management system for, for airport operations and, and uh, you know, and the uh, you know, airside operations. And it was fantastic. I absolutely loved it. But um, Amazon announced their UAS program back in, I think it was 2013. And it just piqued my interest. Um, I love tech, generally speaking. I like to stay up on all that information. And naturally, um, you know, I, I put myself out there, reached out to a few few individuals, more or less just out of interest, uh, not because I was necessarily looking for anything. And uh, one thing led to another. And, and at that time, you know, SMS was was in when it's in its you know infancy and just starting to be required for 121 carriers. Um, and others were seeing the, the writing on the wall, including Amazon Prime Air, and they were looking for a safety manager to help implement and build a safety management system. So, um, yeah, one thing led to another. An opportunity came my way. And, um, you know, thankfully, my, my wife uh, always wanted to live in England. And, uh, you know, one thing led to another and decided to, to take the risk and um, transition to the UAS space. And I haven't looked back since. So I, I can say I think the UAS uh, aspect found me. I didn't find it. That's quite a unique story. So let's talk about safety management for a little bit, because that's obviously a big part. And you said a lot of 121 carriers now coming out with safety management systems. Can you just give us a little brief background of what a safety management system is and how it would apply in your operation there? You know, safety management systems to me, it essentially creates structure. It's a business approach to managing safety. Um, you know, there's four components, you know, safety, uh, safety policy, safety assurance, safety risk management, and safety promotion. And, and really it creates accountability throughout an organization. It ensures that safety is built into every aspect of, of what an organization is doing. And it, just, it doesn't just apply to, to aviation. You know, it's used in trucking and other industries. Um, it's a very valuable tool, but it, it really creates the accountability throughout the org for every role. Um, and I'm a huge fan of it. And you know, it, it's very unique taking an SMS program that was inevitably built for a 121 you know, air carrier um, and trying to scope it and apply it towards, you know, UAS operations. Um, you know, it's not a one size fits all approach, you know. So, you know, here, here at Zipline, I know, and others in, in my industry share the same, same sentiment, essentially that, you know, we look at our, our crews, our aircraft, no differently than a major air carrier does. I think that's, that's an essential component to the way we need to think because we're sharing the airspace. We don't want to be a nuisance. You know, we want to be, we want to collaborate and safely you know, integrate into the airspace uh, without, without creating, you know, any unnecessary safety issues, et cetera. But, you know, here at Zipline, you know, we're taking AC 120, you know, 92 Alpha, for those who know what that is, you know, relating to SMS, you know, and we're, we're incorporating that internally. You know, we really strive for a non-punitive, predictive safety culture as part of our day-to-day -day operations. And, you know, type certification and part 135 efforts are also forcing functions to, to kind of build in these additional layers of safety to include aspects of safety management systems. So, you know, here at Zipline, it's, it's really an ongoing effort and, and safety never stops, as we all know. And, and we don't necessarily want to reinvent the wheel, as I mentioned. You know, we're, we're taking, you know, what's been done in the 121 space and, and now applying that in a very unique uh, environment, which is, which is UAS. Um, although it, a lot of the same elements are, are shared, it is fundamentally different um, considering the aircraft, um, for the most part, autonomous. You know, we're not in the aircraft, we're on the ground. Um, but again, we're, we're, we're never stopping that continuous improvement mindset. Um, we're taking what's been built um, already from, you know, the many years learned in aviation, specifically with SMS, and now just bridging the gap on the UAS side. I know you mentioned that SA, SMS is not a one-size-fits-all approach, and you did work at Amazon for a while. Are there really 
um, I know different between like the airlines versus UAS. Are there vast differences between operations like Zipline and Amazon then as well? Um, you know, I mean, we're all trying to solve very similar problems. We're all trying to, you know, take new technology and integrate into the national airspace system. We're all trying to figure out how to unlock beyond visual line of sight operations that are, that are truly scalable and economical. Um, you know, so, you know, it's in that sense, we're, we're all kind of in it together, um, to move the industry forward. Um, but you know, there's, there's not too many fundamental differences. The, the, probably the biggest similarity is the fact that we are taking a, you know, an aviation culture and a tech culture and trying to, to merge those two together. And, you know, if, if you think about it, the tech culture wants to move fast. They want to innovate and aviation uh, moves much slower. Um, and it's all around, you know, safety and the safe integration into the airspace, safety of those on the ground, safety of those in the air. Um, and trying to merge those two mentalities and those two cultures is very, very challenging, both at Zipline and Amazon. But I think as the past several years have gone on, especially since I got involved in 2015, there was, you know, in the beginning, a resilience to bringing individuals that had traditional aviation experience into the UAS space because it was really big tech at the time. Um, where now there's been a paradigm shift where organizations are starting to recognize, hey, we're going to need to bring in this expertise. Um, and it's about finding that and fusing those, those cultures together, building something new uh, without lo losing what's important from both aspects, being able to move fast, but move fast safely in a compliant manner. Now, your experience, as you just mentioned, took you over to England and some other places in the world. Is it different operating in other countries than it is in the U.S.? I know that we'll talk about some of the future of UAS in, in the United States, but with your experience, how different is it to operate in other foreign areas? Um, you know, it was a learning curve. Um, definitely a learning, learning curve. Uh, you know, I, I went in with certain assumptions, uh, but I quickly learned that, you know, you want to be open to validating those assumptions and, and, and devalidating those assumptions, if you will. Um, you know, really you have to go into it with some set of expectations without, you know, over or under committing, if you will, but they're, they're very similar. The, the biggest difference is really around kind of their approach for, you know, management communication. And really that comes down to the culture. Um, and that's, even if you're just traveling, generally speaking, you know, getting uh, adopting to the culture is, is a challenging aspect. So that's, that's one of the, the biggest things, but, but they're all in it. Um, you know, they're all in it for safe, scalable, repeatable operations, that philosophy doesn't change. And, and I quickly realized being in the UK and dealing with the CAA and, and EASA that, you know, they really work hand in hand between the FAA, EASA, CAA, and other regulatory bodies around the world. Uh, there's a lot of collaborative efforts underway, both, both on the manned and the unmanned side. I mean, I was really just really exposed to the unmanned side and, and the different collaborative efforts around the world from, from standards groups to just the regulatory bodies themselves is really encouraging to see. Um, you know, it's not that there's gonna be a one size fits all back to that theme for, uh, for you know, UAS integration, but the fact that, you know, these regulators and, and even, you know, industry are, are talking to each other is, is a really encouraging aspect. But, but again, it, it's really just the, the cultural aspects around, you know, the way, the way they approach problems, the new ways of managing, uh, but, but they all have the same philosophy around, around safety, compliance, et cetera. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about Zipline specifically now. And I know one of the things I was going to ask first is, you know, what is Zipline's main mission in what it's operating? And then if you could tell us that, and maybe a little bit about what your job position uh, allows you to do. Yeah, sure. So, you know, our mission is to provide every human on earth with, with instant access to vital medical supplies. Um, so this, this is no no easy feat. Um, you know, we're currently operating in Rwanda and Ghana to scale, essentially to national scale, which is very, very impressive. And, and honestly, when I was over overseas for my initial training, very impactful. Um, but I can go into that later on. But, you know, the U.S., we are actively seeking, you know, our Part 135 and our type certification. And, and a majority of the time, you know, my time is spent building and driving, you know, the organization to establish a safe and compliant UAS airline, you know, but, uh, this is really not reinventing the wheel as we are using our international operations as a baseline, um, but we're rather redefining, you know, our mission overseas to be applicable to the UAS space. Um, so now that we're, you know, moving to with our ongoing COVID-19 response, you know, with partnership Navant, 
you know, we're currently flying under 107. It's very difficult to have an impact, a national scale, you know, in the current regulatory environment, but we're actively working, you know, to get our 135, driving those continuous improvements, working with industry, working with regulators to enable us to actually eventually get to a point where we can truly, you know, exercise our mission to provide you know, every human on earth or here in the U.S. with, with some level of instant access to vital medical supplies. So what would your day-to-day -day responsibilities be like? Great, great question. So right now, I'm, I'm really focused on, you know, since we're actively obtaining our, our Part 135, our type certification, we have our Part 107 operation currently underway to support COVID-19 response. You know, a, a lot of my time is kind of working to move us towards uh, obtaining our Part 135 and, and type certificate. So, you know, day to day, I'm you know, building manuals, building policies, process procedures, working to integrate those into the operation. And, and the really, you know, it's, it's unfortunate circumstances, you know, with our 107 operation in response to COVID-19, but the benefit for, for us as Zipline is it's enabling us to actively kind of test some of these assumptions, put into actual practice our Part 135 policies, processes, and procedures, and vet those out early so we can learn rapidly. So when the time comes for us to, to validate those, we can, uh, you know, or validate our 135, we can do so successfully. And then really, I mean, after I'm very optimistic, once we receive our, our 135 and our type certification, I mean, my role really becomes more traditional, you know, director of operations, ensuring that we're, we're safe, we're compliant, and we're continuing to operate, you know, in accordance to all of the guidance, um, you know, applicable to, to Zipline. Well, I'd like to, if we could, kind of talk about the Zipline aircraft, because that's something that's unique to Zipline, because I believe you manufacture or at least produce your own. So if you could kind of talk about the uh, the aircraft itself, and then we also have a, a short video kind of showing the, the launch and recovery of a system too. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd be happy to. I mean, there's, you can see it behind me. There's the, the, the body, what we call the body. Um, you know, we have a, a modular design, you know, we have a separate wing, we have a separate body, we insert the battery, I'm sitting next to actually the battery charging units here. Um, you know, it's a modular design, it's, it's, it's designed that way for, for ease of storage, but also maintenance. Um, so it's a very unique design, but it's, there's actually an elegance to its simplicity. You know, and unlike you think UAS, you think of a quadcopter, you know, and ours is, is generally, a, it's a fixed wing. Um, so it's a little bit less intimidating um, in a lot of ways. But we have about a 10 foot wingspan, we're about six feet in length. Uh, we have dual props, um, both a push and a, and a pull. Um, and we have about uh, 50, about 55 nautical mile, uh, you know, range in one direction. Um, you know, so it, it's quite substantial. And we travel around 60 to 65 knots, uh, relatively speaking. And, um, you know, we load the payload. You can see the payload phase right there. We load the package. Um, it flies over, uh, you know, a predetermined position. It drops the package. Our accuracy currently is about two parking spots, believe it or not, in, in varying wind conditions. It's very, very impressive and exciting to see both the launch and the, and the, uh, and the drop is, is very interesting and unique. Um, comes back and it recovers. Um, but uh, yeah, again, very simple design, but there's a lot of elegance to it. And, and it's fully autonomous aircraft, you know, so the mission is preloaded. Uh, we do a lot of GIS work leading up to it to make sure our routes are in compliance with what we've agreed upon with the FAA. Um, as well as our internal safety protocols and route design uh, specs. Uh, and then the aircraft goes on its way. Um, if it detects an internal failure or anything else, um, it can turn back and can go into a hold. And in the unlikely event of um, you know, imminent danger to another aircraft or person on the ground, it does have a power land system. So we can deploy that power land system both via the controller or the PIC, uh, pilot in command, or it can do it autonomously if certain parameters um, are, are met. So um, yeah, that's our aircraft in a nutshell, but um, I'm sure some of you have seen the video, but it's, uh, it's definitely very, very simplistic. Yeah, I'll go, ahead and, I'll go ahead and play the video now, and then um, we can, maybe you can kind of talk us through the, uh, the launch here and the recovery. Yeah, so you can see we're, we're carrying the, the body, as I, meant that, I mentioned that modular design so as we're, we're carrying the body to the, to the launcher, we, we place it in the launcher. And at this point, this is when they're assembling it. Um, you can see they're placing the nose cone on. This is our controller um, kind of prepping the crew, prepping the airspace. Um, and then you can see the crew doing their pre-flight. Um, we get the permission from the controller, uh, who is again, our, our uh, pilot in commander PIC. And once the airspace is clear, uh, the pre-flight's done, all the self, you know, autonomous self checks are completed. We go ahead and launch the aircraft, which you'll see here momentarily. So it's launched at this point. The controller has their, uh, has their ground control station, which 
which has multiple uh, screens, both a single primary flight display and three multifunction displays, um, showing weather, telemetry, you know, other traffic that's broadcasting. And you can see the drop here. There's a screenshot of that, uh, of that user interface. So we, you know, they, we grab the package, they bring it into the health facility. Uh, this specific delivery was our first um, here in North Carolina, and we delivered uh, PPE, I believe it was, it was masks. And then the zip uh, returns, and it comes into our recovery system, as you're about to see. And much like an aircraft carrier, it snags that line, uh, brings the aircraft down, swings down, flight operator uh, grabs the aircraft, disassembles it, as you can see in these next few scenes places all those back on the rack appropriately, does a post-flight inspection to ensure that they remain in airworthy condition, uh, and then we rinse and repeat. Um, and that's a little bit of what, what it looks like. Looks exciting. How, uh, so if I were to go there and we were to try and fly, what's the actual start time from when we show up to when we can actually get one in the air on the launcher? Yeah, great question. So, I mean, we, we operate in 10-hour in shifts um, you know, much like a traditional flight crew, you know, we have a 10 hour duty day, uh, 12 hour rest period and about a 50 hour max duty period per week. Um, and again, that's some of this, these traditional aspects and, and flavor that we're incorporating now into the UAS space. Um, but we show up um, about 8 a.m. There's um, essentially pre-flight checks on all of our equipment from the aircraft, the launcher, the recovery system, the ground control station. Those checks from arrival to completion take anywhere from, you know, 20 to 30 minutes. And essentially, we're, uh, we're ready with an aircraft once we brief the crews um, about 30, 30 to 45 minutes after initial arrival in the morning. Um, so I, I compare that to a, you know, an air crew arriving at the airport. They get into the crew room. They do a quick briefing. They get to the aircraft. They do their pre-flight checks, both in the, in the, you know, in the front and the back. Uh, they push back and off they go. So similar, similar mindset, similar philosophy. But from start to finish and ready to flight, about yeah, 30 to 45 minutes. So how many flights a day can you operate there? Well, uh, so I'll kind of, here's a unique situation just because the regulatory environment. So I'll, I'll kind of first talk about our, our international operations. You know, we, we can operate up to 100 or 150 flights per day. That is rapid fire. Um, that is multiple aircraft to a single uh, pilot. Um, and, and of course, the regulatory environment is much, much different in Rwanda and Ghana. Um, but on average overseas, you know, we're, we're talking anywhere from 30 to 50 flights per day. Um, and that just really varies on the customer demand. Here in the U.S., um, at a test facility in, in Davis, California, um, we're, we're roughly averaging about the same as our international operations. But that's rapid fire, high volume testing, testing new software versions, platforms, etc. But operationally speaking, for our 107 response to COVID-19, um, we're averaging about uh, two flights per day. Um, but we've done up to five, uh, excuse me, up to six flights. So it's a much slower cadence. It's built based on both customer demand and also just what we're capable of from a regulatory perspective. Um, there is this kind of saying, I'm sure many on this call have heard that the FAA has, but it's crawl, walk, run. Um, and this, this phase that we're currently in and many other UAS operators is essentially the crawl phase. Um, so, you know, much, much lower volume learning rapidly, driving those continuous improvements. And, and hopefully when we have this conversation again in a, in a year's time, uh, that volume will be comparable to our international operations. So if we talk specifically about what you're doing there, you said you're bringing PPE to local, is that local area hospitals? That's correct. So in, um, in partnership with Navant Health Systems here in, in North Carolina, specifically the Charlotte area, um, we're delivering uh, primarily PPE, and that could change based on the demand and, and depending on what happens with, uh, you know, COVID-19. Um, but we're delivering PPE to currently two medical facilities um, in the Huntersville area, which is essentially northern Charlotte region. Um, and again, it's, it's based on demand. Um, and there's, there's, there's other routes that we have currently planned. But again, I'll go back to the, the crawl, walk, run. You know, we're crawling. We're, we're demonstrating our ability to, to operate in accordance to our, our 107 waiver. And this will all lead up eventually to the part 135, which will enable us to expand that footprint um, and hopefully support um, a, a plethora of other hospitals throughout the Navant network in the Charlotte region. And when you talk about your, your international operations, what kind of packages would they be delivering then? Yeah, so they, um, they deliver, and first of all, 
I, I can say it, firsthand experience going there for, for training when I first joined. I was in Rwanda just outside of Kigali uh, for about a month. It was one of the most impactful, experience, impactful experiences of my life to see how much benefit Zipline actually brings to the rural communities in Africa. A lot of times the, the supplies that we're delivering, if it was going by car, would take up to six hours or more just because the, the road infrastructure sometimes is non-existent or is in very poor condition. Um, and we're able to get life-saving supplies you know, in, in 30 minutes to an hour. Um, so we're, we're actually saving lives and making, you know, making a, a real impact in society, which, which was, was incredible to see. But we're delivering things from, from blood, um, vaccines, anti-venoms. Um, and as of just recently, we're taking in, in Ghana, we're taking um, COVID-19 samples that are collected in these rural communities um, and we're delivering them to uh, the, the capital, which I can't recall the name offhand, um, but we're delivering them there so they can be tested rapidly and hopefully get, get uh, control of any you know, outbreaks in these rural villages in Ghana. So, uh, and, and we're always expanding, you know, it's, it's a, we always look at the customer. What does the customer want? What does the customer need um, that, that we can provide that's gonna make an impact? Are there any kind of, I know there's obviously a size dimension, but what about like weight or any kind of limitations that you might have of your cargo? Yeah, so, so right now, actually, I, um, I, I wish I had it next to me. I could show you a box, um, but it's roughly a shoebox size, um, slightly larger, um, and we hold about 3.9 pounds um, and really no more than that. So, you know, let's just round it up and call it, and call it four pounds. Um, but that's, that's multiple units of blood. That's, I mean, you can imagine a vial of, of uh, anti-venom. That's many vials. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we're looking at. And of course, you know, as we, as we look to the future, you know, a couple of years from now, and we're, we're constantly evaluating customer demand and, and what, what those future, um, you know, deliveries may require. And, and I'm sure we'll, we and others will look to expand our footprint in terms of what that capability may be. So I know you said you mentioned you travel to do your training. What would the training be like for, I, I mean, there's probably different positions on the team or the crew. What's the, what are the different positions and what is the training like for your crew? Yeah, yeah. so I'll, I'll kind of, since this is a U.S. focused um, conversation, I'll, I'll kind of speak to what we are doing as we approach our part 135 operation. Um, the different roles that we have um, from a flight operations perspective, there's a flight operator. Think of the flight operator like a ground crew um, turning an aircraft. You know, they're, they're bringing the aircraft in, they're unloading the baggage, right? They're, they're refueling. Uh, our flight operators do essentially that. They help assemble, disassemble the aircraft. Um, they obtain the package, they weigh the package, they load the package. They, um, you know, so that's the flight operator position. Uh, then we have the controller or the, the remote pilot in command, the RPIC. And they're just like, as it sounds, they're, they're responsible for um, those aircraft that are in the air, you know, are monitoring weather, monitoring the telemetry, conducting all pre-flight and post-flight briefings. Um, you know, and that's our more traditional flight crew. And then we have our, our maintenance technicians um, who do exactly that. They're, they're, you know, fixing the aircraft. They're doing regularly scheduled maintenance. Um, so, you know, you can see, and we might have different names, but very, very similar to what you would, would see in traditional, traditional aviation. The training program, it lasts roughly three to four weeks. Um, and we, we don't necessarily, again, we don't want to reinvent the wheel where we don't have to. We're leveraging training programs and methodologies that have been used from the traditional aviation aspect and bringing those, the, the, you know, that goodness into the UAS space. So, you know, it, it, there's a lot of similarities. We start with, with ground training, um, about a week's worth or more of, of ground training, going through systems, just general, in, you know, in doc. Um, we move from that to what we call observation. We want the, the students or trainees to, to understand what they're going to be doing after they've just sat through, which is, you know, very exciting ground, ground, uh, ground training and uh, really understand what that workflow looks like. So they actually observe the position that they're being trained for, whether it's a flight operator or controller. Um, so they can fundamentally understand what they just learned and see how it applies in the real world. Um, after observation, they move into um, what's traditionally called line oriented flight training or loft. We call it application training. That's where they're actually functioning within the role that they're training for while being shadowed by a qualified flight ops instructor. Um, and that, you know, they're just like if you were to get your private pilot's license or your commercial and you're practicing maneuvers, right? The, the, uh, the instructor will demonstrate and then the, uh, the student will actually then 
you know, perform that maneuver. So a, a similar philosophy, but in, in a real environment. Um, and if all, all is successful, they have a practical evaluation and check ride where we put them through an, an oral exam and then they actually have to demonstrate their performance. Um, just like if you were on a traditional check ride for your PPL or, or, uh, or CPL. Um, then we issue their, their certificate if all is successful. And then there's rec uh, currency requirements, just like you would have in the man world, especially 135. There's, there's multiple, multiple things you have to do annually. Um, and, we, and we pull that in, all that goodness, uh, per 135. So how many pilots would you say that you have right now on staff? Uh, System-wide or just here in North Carolina? Well, we'll go with both. Why not? Um, I, I, know I don't have the numbers exact. Um, but if I was to say, you know, looking at Rwanda, Ghana, in the U.S., both our uh, operation here in North Carolina and our testing facility in, in Davis, um, you know, we're probably upwards of, of 200 personnel, uh, flight operations personnel, a combination of flight operators, controllers, and maintenance technicians. So it's quite the heavy lift. And, you know, back to the training question, you know, the uh, training academy um, has traditionally been, been in Rwanda outside of Kigali, and, and it remains that way. That's the primary training facility for international operations. Um, and they've done a, an absolutely fantastic and amazing job scaling up to be able to train these, these many people or that many people, but to such an incredible standard. There's not a lot of differences, you know, when it, and standardization goes a very long way in aviation. So, you know, in terms of the training program that we've built uh, for the U.S. and our Part 135 op, you know, uh, we've leveraged a lot of that goodness, a lot of the years of lessons learned since 2016, since they began operating to, you know, incorporate that into our current training structure. Um, but obviously with what is required for, for 135 in the U.S. regulatory environment. One of the things I noticed in your video was as it was coming in the land, a little weather sensor up there with the wind, wind gauge, anemometer. Um, with a smaller aircraft like this, would you say that forecasting the weather or using the weather products we have is a challenge? Or what are you actually looking at the most? Because I would understand in other parts of the world, they might not have as many airports and sensors as we do here in the U.S. But what matters to you for the weather and what do you look at every day before you actually operate? Yeah, and that's a great question. You know, eventually, like working backwards in the future, you know, from the future, you know, micro weather forecasting, uh, very localized weather forecasting is, is going to be huge. Um, as both UAS and, and urban air mobility, you know, get into the play, you know, that's going to become more and more important. But, you know, you know, rewinding to today, uh, yes, weather is, is challenging. Um, and as you mentioned, overseas, internationally, um, it's even more challenging. The robustness of weather reporting is, is sometimes not non-existent. Um, so, you know, it's, yeah, the challenge internationally is, is huge. Um, you know, we fly in multiple types of weather overseas. Um, wind, storms, rain. Um, we have very strict flight parameters um, built into the system. So if it is sensing that it's, um, you know, in an up, updraft or downdraft or the conditions are exceeding or approaching exceedances um, for the system, uh, the aircraft will, will turn back. Um, or the controller, if they notice something via whatever tools they're using, will initiate a return to, return to nest, as we call it. Um, but here in the U.S., we're we're really fortunate to have the tools that exist today. And for us in North Carolina, um, in the Charlotte region, there's a lot of aircraft, or excuse me, airports that um, you know, are report, actively reporting weather on a, a hourly basis. So we're fortunate enough to have a, a fairly robust um, weather suite, if you will. But for us, operationally, the first thing that we do in the morning, or the controller does, is they go into the control room, they turn on the ground control station, one of the first things they're looking at is the weather forecasting. We use four flight weather. I'm sure pretty much everyone in this call is probably familiar who flies with, with four flight, um, a tremendously useful tool. Um, so we leverage that for cross-referencing all of the different airports throughout Charlotte and trying to identify trends from North Charlotte, South Charlotte, East Charlotte, West Charlotte, um, to kind of create a cohesive weather picture for the small region we're operating in. So almost like an area forecast, but just, for, but just for the Charlotte area. Um, and we found that to be very, very effective. Um, so we complete a, uh, a morning brief or a morning assessment of the weather. Um, so the controller can have a kind of a holistic picture of what, you know, hour by hour, what the weather will look like. We also have a requirement that at the top of every hour, the controller must do another thorough assessment of the weather to make sure uh, things haven't changed. We all know that weather can degrade very, very rapidly, especially during the summer months. Um, so we take that into account but you know, we try prior to flight, we also do a scan of, 
of the weather, uh, but we try not to monitor the weather as, as closely during flight, just because there's so many other things happening. And this is why we take a very proactive approach with leveraging the forecasting tools that currently are in existence um, to help formulate uh, our weather plans. You know, where that needs to get better in the future is things like, um, you know, winds aloft. A lot of times we can only get winds aloft from at, at 3,000 feet, and then we can only deduce what that may be at 400 feet uh, or below. So there's a lot of, of challenges and information we don't have. Um, sometimes we have to make a, a best assumption based on what, what is out there. But um, right now we're finding that um, the, the traditional tool sets that exist are providing, you know, the information that we need to be able to make those proactive decisions. And, and right now in the U.S., we're not, we're not really operating in rain or any convective activity. You know, we're trying to be as, as conservative as possible to enable the highest likelihood of success, um, both to continue to be able to support with COVID-19, but also just progress the industry forward, prove out our capabilities, not only for zip line, but for the rest of the in industry. Because if we succeed, if we succeeds, if everyone succeeds cohesively together as we move forward, um, it, it's just gonna open up the floodgates for everyone else. Yeah, I think that's definitely something that's gonna start to develop over the next few years when UIS becomes more popular the weather forecasting. I know I'd imagine probably wind speed would probably be the next limiting factor besides thunderstorms for you then, right? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Wind speed. I mean, that's, that's the, that's the tough part. We get the question asked by, you know, by the regulators, by customers, well, how do you tell the wind where you're delivering, you know, at, at a hospital or my house? Um, you know, and a lot of times it's just, it's just correlating the weather in the different areas of, of the flight region and, and making a best guess. And, if, you know, as I mentioned, we're, we're very conservative. So if we do see an exceedance somewhere, we, we, we don't fly most of the time. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the next big step is, is that micro weather forecasting, that low level weather forecasting. And I think, you know, the combination of UTM, remote ID, all these tools that are coming down the pipeline in the future, uh, you know, to support UAS and, and UAM um, is just going to make a, make for a much more robust and scalable, um, you know, uh, airspace system for, for all UAS providers. So if we, if we talk about the airspace system now, and the challenges that we face, because you're already, you know, you're operating part 107, you're trying to become part 135. What are some of the challenges that you see actually integrating your operation into the airspace system and really kind of sharing the airspace with manned aircraft? Yeah, it's been one of the absolutely the most exciting parts of this North, this, this North Carolina operation over the past several months. We are, you know, we're inside the Mode C Vale. Um, so, uh, you know, we, a lot of aircraft are broadcasting, you know, especially with the ADSB mandate that started July or January 1st. There are some assumptions to that rule, unfortunately, but uh, we've had a lot of lessons learned thus far. The absolute most challenging part um, to airspace integration thus far has been how to deal with uncooperative aircraft or aircraft that aren't broadcasting their position. Um, you know, that, that's the biggest sticking point uh, from the technological aspect and also the regulatory aspect. So. Finding a solution um, to go, you know, beyond visual line of sight without, you know, the use of, of visual observers or other means is, is really the, the sweet spot. Um, and that's going to be the biggest challenge of getting there because, you know, like I said, it's unfortunate. There's a lot of aircraft still flying around that aren't broadcasting their position. And we have to build technology and other solutions uh, to have a means to see and avoid those aircraft or detect and avoid those aircraft. I'm sure, you know, it's called, you know, DAA, detect and avoid. Um, you know, once we can have that capability, it, it's going to allow for a more seamless and scalable solution for, for operating in the national airspace system. Um, you know, and right now, um, you know, we're, we're fortunate enough to be operating and learning rapidly, um, you know, in, in North Carolina area where we have been actively um, sharing the airspace with manned aircraft. Um, and we've had to actually take um, action to place our aircraft in a hold, for example, to allow a manned, low-flying manned aircraft um, to pass, um, you know, and it's, it's been an incredible experience to, to actively see this technology in such active airspace. And, it, and it's made me realize the challenges that lie ahead for truly scalable solutions. But I don't think it just necessarily lies on, you know, the organizations and the companies building technology, like to support beyond visual and sight, detect and avoid. There's other regulatory pieces to this puzzle that are being solved actively, both with industry and regulators. And that's, you know, part of that is, is UTM, unmanned traffic management, as well as remote ID. And I think the combination of, of the beyond visual on site DAA technology, UTM and remote ID, those, those are the key components to successfully and safely integrating, you know, drones into the national airspace system. 
Um, you know, and until that point, I think there's going to be a lot of tactical and strategic mitigations required for safe integration. Um, but I, I think we're, as we as Zipline and, and the industry is, is well, well on its way. Now, I know part 107, you're probably limited to 400 feet as your maximum altitude. Would you prefer to fly higher or is it okay being low level? I know wind and turbulence are probably a challenge. I just didn't know if, if you would actually prefer to have your system at a higher altitude. Um, with the current constraints in, in between manned and aviation and unmanned, in, in today's state, no, I don't, I don't think so. Because, you know, by flying lower, it allows us to have a bit more control. You know, for those aircraft who may not be broadcasting, you know, we can go out and do community outreach. That's been one of the more interesting and fun aspects to this North Carolina operation is, is getting to know the airspace users, reaching out to helicopter operators, power, uh, power line inspection units, um, you name it, um, and just general airspace users. Um, to kind of spread the word, show where we're flying, show our aircraft, build trust in the community. Um, you know, because if we started flying higher, then we're, we, we kind of lose some control aspects. Um, you know, there's more aircraft because, um, you know, in the area we're flying, they shouldn't realistically be flying below 500 feet uh, due to the, you know, the population density. Of course, that's not always, always the case, um, but that's one, you know, added mitigation to this, this puzzle. So I think at this point in the industry, staying below 400 feet, um, does a lot of good. But, but with that said, you know, through our autonomous systems and DAA, if for some reason we needed to take, you know, evasive action um, to avoid another aircraft, either through uh, manual or automated means, um, exceeding that 400 foot threshold, I think there's, there's an absolute um, justification to that if it's, if it's for safety at, at this stage. Okay. Well, if we kind of keep looking towards the future, what do you see as the next big step? I know integration is part of it and the weather forecasting is part of it. Do you see anything uh, maybe from a, a flight perspective? I don't I, how much hand flying UAS pilots would need versus automation or the looking towards having more people. I know you mentioned visual line of sight as another issue. Where do you see the, the U industry kind of growing and evolving over the next few years? Ooh, uh, Fantastic question. Um, let me let me think about this for a moment. Um, Make you sweat even more with that question. Yeah, let me let me get my let me get my, my <laughs> hanky here and, uh, and wipe the sweat. Um, you know, so I'll kind of I'll frame it with with the current state with COVID nineteen. You know, and COVID nineteen, you know, has been a, a regulatory and societal forcing function to see how drone applications are, are rapidly being seen as an effective delivery mechanism, not only for contactless delivery, but just general convenience, right? Um, there's always been public opposition um, across the board, um, and that's probably been one of the biggest gates. And it's unfortunate circumstances with COVID-19, but it has been breaking down these gates sooner rather than later, allowing these UAS applications or delivery operations specifically to gain a foothold. And I think the general public is starting to see that it's, it's practical and it's a realistic means of delivery. Um, now, scalability is a different story, but we'll, we'll save that for another time. But I, I think over the next five years, we'll, we'll see a mix of, of medical and consumer goods being delivered by UAS across the country. But, but I think the key metric here is with very, within very targeted regions. And from that point, slowly growing from rural to more suburban and eventually urban very, very rapidly. But again, it kind of goes back to that theme of a crawl, walk, run. Um, and we're in the, the FAA and industry is really currently in those in those learning stages. But I think I'm, I'm making a, uh, a prediction here, but I think in 10 years, we will be to a point where the technology, airspace integration and regulatory frameworks are going to be enable be at a point where it's going to enable drone delivery across the board um, with ease very much. If you wanted to be a part 135 um, operator today, it's not easy, but there's there's a path forward for doing so. Um, in an easy and a compliant matter. And I think within 10 years, we'll be there. And I think I need to mention, I mentioned it a few times, but I think the UAM, urban air mobility efforts, um, are also helping expedite these efforts in many ways because we're solving essentially the same problems. We're operating below a thousand feet. It's new types of integration. They wanna eventually be autonomous rather than piloted, right? So the combination of these two efforts, I think we're just gonna, that may shrink that, that 10 year time frame. Uh, but it's still a big TBD, but I do think that we're on our way. And I, I don't know who said it recently, but somebody said it and they said the next 10 years is going to be the golden age of, of commercial UAS drone delivery. And I honestly could not agree more. 
Well, thank you for that. Um, before we get to some of the questions our audience has asked us, I, we have a, a little segment that we like to call the rapid fire segment where we just ask you a few kind of quick questions here. So uh, first off, I know you traveled around the world quite a bit. What were some of the fl your favorite places that you visited in your travels? Ooh, um, I would say, um, so when I was living in the UK, uh, working for Amazon Prime Air, I had the, um, the fortunate um, you know, privilege of, of coaching Cambridge University's ice hockey team. And we had a tournament in St. Moritz, Switzerland, and it was absolutely one of the most magical, beautiful places I've ever been to. Um, and it was one of the most memorable experiences of, of my life. Um, we played, you know, an outdoor hockey tournament um, and just is ingrained in my mind. So I think St. Moritz, Switzerland does it for me, but I will say uh, another, another beautiful, place that is one of our favorites is, is Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, absolutely beautiful. Okay, who's your favorite hockey team? Oh, Tampa Bay Lightning, greatest hockey team on the <laughs> planet. <laughs> All right. What, uh, what's one of your most uh, memorable aviation experiences? I would say for me, it's my um, Allegiant Airlines internship. I was able to sit, believe it or not, um, in the most comfortable jump seat out there um, in the MD-80 for about 100 hours of jump seat time. Um, being very sarcastic, it was one of the most uncomfortable seats, but uh, uh, that was probably, as a young aviator at the time, had probably one of the most profound impacts on my aviation career on, on both what to do and what not to do. Okay, what is your favorite airplane? Um, I, I have to have a twofer here. So I, I have to say, growing up, it was the F-104 Starfighter. Um, there was one based at St. Pete Clearwater International Airport at the time. I would see it flying and absolutely fell in love with it. Um, and then an aircraft that I've actually flown is the Epic LT. At the time I flew it, it was a um, it was experimental, but they finally got their type certification, an absolute you know, single engine rocket ship. Okay. How about your favorite UAS? I do not have a favorite at this point. Um, I love them all. But I think for me, you know, it's, it's a young industry you know, different foot, uh, platforms are establishing a foothold. It's constantly evolving. I don't have a favorite. I think they're all incredible in their own unique way. They all have a unique uh, customer set um, and what they're trying to accomplish and, you know, communities they're trying to serve. So don't have a favorite yet, but, you know, talk to me in a couple of years and I think we'll have a different story. Okay. 10 years from now when UAS is delivering things everywhere, what's one of Naturally. the first things you're going to have uh, delivered to your house? So as a father of three young boys, or soon to be three young boys, uh, or another one we're adding to the family, I, I'm pretty confident that I'm going to be having delivered Band-Aids, uh, hydrogen peroxide, and Neosporin. Those are probably going to be first on the list. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's switch to some of the, the Q&A section that we have here. And a lot of the Q&A that we've gotten is really kind of asking you for some advice, both maybe what you'd give to younger students that want to pursue a career path. And then we'll talk about some more advice later on, but what would you give advice wise for uh, younger students or maybe your earlier self when you're going into this industry? I think, you know, not so much the UAS industry, but just, you know, aviation or really any industry, don't be afraid to put yourself out there. Um, you know, things aren't just going to come your way and, and fall in your lap. I think it's a matter of really taking the initiative, find an internship, you know, um, find an internship that maybe isn't up your alley. You know, I, I've, I've, my experience is incredibly diverse. I've worked in airports, I've worked in airlines and now UAS. Um, and I think if you can have some experience diversity to build upon early in your career, whether that's from, from internships or actual jobs, I think that's going to set you up uh, for success in the future because you're going to understand how all these different aspects of, of aviation kind of come together. Um, I think if you're too narrow-minded, um, sometimes you can, can kind of get lost and maybe not have an understanding of, of how something works or how it'll affect another aspect of the industry. So I think the more diverse experience that you can have is fantastic. But I think uh, the number one thing is just don't be afraid to put yourself out there. Take an initiative to get an internship. Go, go clean airplanes on the weekend. Um, do what you need to do to get that exposure. I think that will go an incredibly long way. Uh, and obviously, Embry-Riddle, uh, you know, that's, that's the icing on the cake. I think one of the interesting things that I kind of hear you saying is that internships don't necessarily have to be in UAS to really help somebody who wants to excel in UAS later in their career. A hundred percent. I mean, we're, 
if we don't have the support of eventually the airline pilots association, for example, as a, as a UAS industry, you know, there's going to be a lot of headbutt. Um, you know, so I think the more cohesiveness we can have and, and building trust is going to go a long way. And I think like, yeah, having that, that experience in the different, different areas and understanding how those come together. Yeah. I think it's, it's just going to benefit all of us in the long run. Okay. Well, I think, uh, I know Dr. Stoltzer is going to come back and give us some closing statements in just a minute here, but I'd like to thank you for your time and your, your knowledge. I think it's unique to have the UAS perspective because we kind of tend to focus on manned aviation quite a bit. So hearing what you have to say about UAS and the, uh, the unmanned side of things is really interesting. So I want to thank you very much for your time and for sweating it out for us in your <laughs> hangar. <laughs> is there anything else you'd like to share with uh, our future and current students? Um, you know, the last thing I'll say in terms of a closing remark is the fact that, you know, for me, even in my current position, and especially at Amazon, when I first moved from traditional aviation to tech, I was put in a lot of very uncomfortable situations in terms of not necessarily knowing how to do something. It was the first time I was doing something or had to build something. Don't be afraid to put yourself in those situations because that's how you learn best. You're, it's a forcing function for you to really kind of dive deep and understand you know, what it takes to succeed uh, for that, that single project that you may be put on. But just don't be afraid to be put in uncomfortable situations. It's, it's really part of your growth. Um, and, I, and I think it'll just build, build your, your character and your career you know, further as, as you move along. But uh, thank you for the time. I've really enjoyed this and uh, wish, wish everyone the best and best of luck in their careers. And please feel free to reach out if anybody you know, has any questions. Uh, I'm happy to, uh, happy to answer them. So thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Stoltzer, back to you. Thank you, Bob. And Joseph, that was fantastic. And uh, I think just what we were hoping for, really, really informative. Um, excellent comments on, uh, on several things. SMS, which, as you know, is my passion as well. And there's so many opportunities to bring safety into uh, unmanned, into urban air, into all aspects of aviation. So really, really key comments there that you made. Uh, some of your comments about safe, scalable, uh, repeatable operations could not agree more. And, and uh, you know, that's what it's all about going forward. Um, I mentioned to you the other day that the modular design uh, you guys have done looks, it looks like it's just amazing and so efficient. And uh, as you said, elegant uh, in its simplicity. And I think that's really an apt description. So. Uh, really, really interesting stuff, and I just want to say best wishes to you and to uh, Zipline, and congratulations for all the great work you've been uh, doing and will continue to do. Um, we're planning uh, more uh, superb uh, web webinars, and we'll be announcing those very soon, so stay tuned to our Aviation Outlook uh, webpage for updates. Uh, thank you all for attending, and good night from Embry-Riddle. Mm -hmm.